temperature limit of the entropy, where you take the zero temperature limit after taking the n goes to infinity limit. So you take the thermodynamic limit first, then the zero temperature limit, it's non-zero. Uh, now this formally seems to violate the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, and so we put this result in the appendix of our paper. <laughs> but we didn't want to draw too much attention to it. We said this is really bizarre. Uh, but we understand that very much better now and, uh, and think it is actually a very interesting and maybe even potentially observable property uh, of a, you know, some class of uh, non-Fermi liquids. Uh, now there's, there are other models you may have heard of like Pauling's ice model. Uh, which is, you know, different ways of arranging water molecules in ice. Uh, and for in the Pauling's ice model, you get an exponentially large ground state degeneracy, uh, and therefore it violates the third law of thermodynamics, something like number of dimer packings on the square lattice. Let's think of that problem. Uh, but now if you put in some interactions between the dimers, uh, you immediately lift this degeneracy. No matter what you put in, uh, it's highly, highly non-robust. It's an exact degeneracy, first of all, and it's highly non-robust. Any perturbation will lift it. Uh, in this case, it turns out the entropy is, is very robust. First of all, it's not a degeneracy. Uh, it's extremely robust, and only one perturbation can lift it. Uh, all others are not important. Uh, in fact, the one perturbation is the one I already told you about, the TIJ perturbation. That's the only thing that can lift it. All right, so now I want to give you some inkling of where those results come from. Where's the clock? So I have to. <laughs> okay, another half an hour, okay. All right, so let me just uh, tell you how these things are solved. So first thing you can look for, let's even put mu equals zero if you want. Uh, that's the simpler particle hole symmetric case. Uh, you can try to say, okay, is this solution compressible? Is there a solution? And is the solution compressible or not? Or in other words, is there an energy gap? So let's say there is an energy gap. Well, if there is an energy gap, uh, this would mean that imaginary part of sigma on the real frequency axis would be zero below, below the energy gap. And that would mean the imaginary part of G would be zero. Uh, so if there's an energy gap, let's call it delta. So let's say M sigma uh, omega less than delta on the real axis is zero. Okay, this equation tells us because the, this becomes omega plus i eta, so the imaginary part can only be non-zero at the same frequency. So this tells you mg omega less than delta is also zero. But now look at this equation. You write this equation in frequency space. Uh, this becomes a kind of like a convolution equation uh, of the spectral densities, if you know the name on spectral densities. Uh, and what you see from here, just kind of like energy conservation. You have some excitations which carry uh, omega, omega, omega here. So the right-hand side will be zero unless you give up enough frequency to overcome the energy gap of all three Gs. Uh, and, and so this tells you, the, this equation will tell you from this that M sigma uh, omega less than three delta is zero. Okay, <laughs> so that's impossible, either delta is zero or infinity. Uh, infinity makes no sense, you have no particles, that's the empty universe. Uh, therefore, we pick the case, so the only answer is for me, the imaginary part of uh, G, uh, delta is zero, okay? So we're gonna now assume it's gapless. All right, so if it's gapless, that means there's a branch cut all the way down to in the frequency space down to zero frequency. Or if I, uh, if I write G of tau in tau space, uh, I'm going to be a little careful here. And again, my signs will be all messed up, uh, but it'll be one over tau to some exponent alpha. Uh, and then I'm going to put a constant here, uh, minus A tau to the alpha, uh, where alpha equals what? So this is just a generic gapless solution. Now, if you did, uh, this for a Fermi liquid, the case I talked about earlier, that's also a gapless solution. And if you took the Fourier transform of that semicircle, what you get at long time is alpha equals one and A equals one, okay? For a Fermi liquid, alpha equals one and A equals one, 
Okay, so that's the particle hole. So that's the fact that A is one. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you what these two cases are. Sorry, this is say tau greater than zero, tau less than zero. So this is like proper, you're adding a particle, this is like removing a particle, okay? One is moving forward in time, that's a backward in time in the convention. So this is just giving the amplitude to remove, add a particle and annihilate it later, or remove a particle and add one back later. Those two processes in a Fermi liquid are symmetric to leading order because of the finite density of states at the Fermi level. All right, so now you can just make this ansatz and stick it in here and see what you get. So this is, again, very simple. Uh, what happens? Well, um, um, okay, so sigma of tau, again, I'm being very sloppy here. Sigma of tau goes one, one over tau to the three alpha, which will tell me that sigma of omega will be, it turns out to be not divergent, sigma of zero plus some omega, so d tau, uh, let's be three alpha minus one, just the Fourier transform of that, if I got that right. Okay, and now we've got to plug this in here. Let's see, now we've got sigma of omega. Uh, so this um, i omega always turns out to be less important at low frequencies. Uh, when we, f we can check this later, uh, depending on the value of alpha in it. So it turns out not to matter. I think I made a mistake somewhere. Three alpha. Oh, no, yeah, it's correct. So this we can ignore because it vanishes as omega goes to zero. But we'd have to worry about this. So now g of, g of omega, I should say, uh, should be then g of omega uh, will be omega to the, take the Fourier transform of that uh, will be omega to the alpha minus one. We'll see that alpha is less than one, is the only solution. So this is divergent. Now if g of omega is divergent as omega goes to zero, this better be divergent. And we see there's no, uh, how is it gonna diverge even if, if sigma actually goes to some constant, which it does, uh, the only way it can diverge is if this mu cancels the constant. Otherwise there's no solution. So in fact, sigma of zero must equal mu. This one, just the Fourier transform of this. So the first line comes from this, then I Fourier transform this. It will turn out that three alpha uh, is greater than one, and therefore this is not divergent, so there's a constant here. So uh, greater than zero, this will be greater than zero. You can check all the other cases that they don't work. <laughs> okay, so, so you must have sigma of zero equals mu. Uh, and this is kind of similar to what happens, for example, in the Bose gas, there are similar conditions uh, that when you have Goldstone excitations, the self-energy has to cancel the bare mass. It's some not, you're not having broken symmetry here, but it's a result of that flavor. Something is almost condensed. Okay. Uh, all right, so then this cancels out, and now you're done. So now you just have to, uh, this has to match that uh, from the first equation. So this tells me alpha minus one is minus, minus three alpha minus one. And if I've done that correct, alpha is one half. Okay. Um, so, so in fact, that's the answer. This is square one half, and this is one half. Okay. Um, but there's this is still this constant A. <laughs> now you can work this through more carefully. Uh, you go ahead and solve it, you find that it can be solved, at least this type of analysis works for any constant A. You can, uh, it's, it's in fact not fixed by these low frequency equations. So it's an arbitrary constant, and uh, I'm going to call it, uh, uh, yeah, so let me put that down. Uh, okay, so G of tau, let me write this with the full signs because this is quite important for my purposes. And I'll put it over here. So G of tau uh, is equal to, turns out, minus uh, one over square root of tau 
or tau greater than zero. And I'm going to write it as e to the minus two pi e over the square root of tau, or tau less than zero. Um, yes, okay. Uh, there should be mod tau here. All right, so, so my claim, which is easy to verify, this is really quite easy, just a bunch of Fourier transforms, is verify that uh, the most general solution to these equations in the low frequency or long time limit are of this form. Uh, there, there's an overall prefactor which, you can, which is actually fixed. You can determine the prefactor, uh, but this constant E is not determined. Now, why am I writing in this very strange way? Well, you'll see shortly, I don't know, maybe not today, uh, this E is the electric field on the surface of a black hole with the ADS2 horizon. Uh, so if you have a black hole and it's got some electric field coming out, then it's natural to see that adding a particle to the black hole it costs different energy from moving a particle because there's electric field in one direction. Uh, so there's a particle hole asymmetry to a black hole. Uh, and this will, uh, this is exactly that. And E will be exactly the electric field. That's why I put a factor of 2 pi here to anticipate that. Yes? Is also to Q. Thank you. So next point. So what did, in this problem, before I jump into black hole, what determines E? Well, there's one condition that I haven't satisfied, uh, which is the uh, Q. Q is expectation only of C dagger C. Uh, let's put a 1 over N here. Uh, so this we can try to evaluate. Now, this is not easy to evaluate because this is uh, at time tau equals 0. So this is uh, uh, 0, 0. Okay, you have to take the time order to make them. So in terms of the frequency, this is something like 1 over N d omega d of omega. Uh, so it involves all frequencies. I only know the structure at low frequencies. So in principle, what I have to do is put the things into, into a computer, get the full solution at all frequencies, uh, and then figure out, uh, given the value of Q, what is the value of E, and similarly, what is the value of mu? All of that you can try to determine numerically. Now, all of that's been done. We did quite a bit of it. That's what we were doing in the early days, making sure this all worked out. Uh, but then in work with uh, Antoine George and Olivia Parcolet, we, there was a very surprising result, which is sort of like a UVIR matching. Uh, that is, E, in, as you see, is a long time property. This is all as tau goes to tau much, much greater than 1 over u naught. This is not true at smaller times. This is this, the low frequency behavior. Uh, whereas Q is a high frequency behavior. It depends on all frequencies. Now, in ordinary Fermi liquid theory, there is something called the Luttinger theorem. Uh, which is also has a relationship of this type. So uh, if you have a uh, uh, Fermi liquid which conserves momentum, it has a Fermi surface in momentum space. Uh, and all the states inside the Fermi surface are occupied, the states outside are empty. Now, of course, if you have free fermions, uh, then the volume of the states inside the Fermi surface must equal number of particles. Now, a very deep theorem called the Luttinger theorem uh, is that the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface equals the number of particles independent of interactions. It's still true, no matter what interaction you get, provided you have a Fermi liquid phase. Uh, and that's also kind of like a UVIR matching, uh, because the density uh, is a high frequency property, depends on green smoke at all frequencies. Uh, but the Fermi surface, the position of the Fermi surface, is the locus of points in momentum space we have zero energy excitations. That's what the Fermi surface is, where the, there are zero energy excitations, uh, quasi-particle excitations. So it's a very low frequency property. So the locus of points where you have zero energy excitations is somehow related to the total density. So this is one of those amazing theorems in condensed matter physics. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, except one. Okay. So if you do now look up the textbook proof of this, uh, it's highly unenlightening. You have to go through pages of algebra of things called luttinger watt functionals and all kinds of contour integrals and out pops the answer. Uh, and it's only recently that there's been a, a, a better understanding of this from Oshikawa, 
who gave a, what in your language would be called an anomaly matching argument. You take your system and put it on a torus and you insert a flux through the hole of the torus and you match the anomalies on the uh, momentum in, imparted by the flux and with some certain addition, additional assumptions you can come up with the answer. Now it turns out amazingly there's a similar result here in similar flavor uh, but the proofs we have of it are very much in the traditional Fermi liquid. That is the pages of algebra which I'm going to spare you uh, which give you an exact answer which we've checked numerically. So this turns out Q is fully determined by some known function and it's universal function. of E and uh, the notes have the function you can write it down in a few lines. It's got hyperbolic tangents and things like that. <laughs> Inverse hyperbolic tangents in some cinches. It is only defined implicitly. If you do it for general Q it's got all kinds of gamma functions. Uh, anyway so this all right so that in the in the end you determine E from the total density Q. Now for the case of the Majorana Fermi on the Majorana Fermi corresponds to get Q equals one half and then E is just zero, it's kind of a trivial case. All right, so, right. All right, so now let me uh, get to the, some of the other quantities. So is the state compressible? Well, in some sense, it obviously must be because you found a solution for every Q. You give me a Q, uh, I find a solution. Uh, and the system scans between the solution by changing mu. So it does seem like changing mu will uniformly change Q, will change E, although I, you know, I cannot determine the exact relationship between Q and mu. Uh, that depends on everything, just like in a Fermi liquid too. Uh, but it seems very reasonable that's the case. And uh, indeed that's uh, numerically also been checked, that there's a finite compressibility, K which is dQ d mu, uh, is not equal to zero. So we have learned that this is first of all a strange, uh, strange compressible state because of these strange power laws. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, to really understand that it's a non-Fermi liquid, we also have to understand the solution at finite temperature, uh, which is what I'm going to get to uh, in a few minutes. All right. There's one more thing I want to say here is, of course, to introduce the idea of a, of a um, where does the entropy come from? So we have, now that we have the solution, we can try to compute the free energy. So that's a complicated task. Uh, there's expressions for the free energy. Again, you can get an expression of the free energy by summing all graphs. Uh, and you take your Green's function and pr plug it in there and compute the free energy and see what you get. So the surprise there is that you get uh, a, a non-vanishing zero temperature entropy. Uh, but let me try to show that to you in a somewhat different way, okay. So what I want to do is to match this low frequency property with a high frequency property of the Green's function. All right, so the Green's function, remember the full Green's function is I omega n plus mu minus sigma. Okay, so now let's look at G as omega goes to infinity. Well, always in any, the full leading term is one over I omega. Um, sigma basically has to vanish at high enough frequencies or fall off very fast. So that's the leading term. Uh, but what's the next term? There's another term which comes from mu, which is very special. And uh, I should probably look up the signs, but forget it. It's mu over omega squared uh, with some coefficient. So there's a one over omega squared term uh, in the Green's function. All right. At the same time, uh, this, this Green's function here uh, in, uh, well, let's see. It has this strange factor between what happens at tau equals zero plus and what has tau equals zero minus. This factor of e to the minus two pi e. All right. I'm just, I don't remember the precise coefficient, so I'm going to look it up now. So from, from this relation, just knowing this and using lots of Kramer's Kronig, uh, you can establish the following uh, relation. Uh, uh, what's this? 
I'm not used to this iPad. How do I get out of this? Okay. <laughs> uh, ah, there we go. Uh, I thought I had it written down. Yeah, here we go. So what you what you find from here uh, that uh, right d by oh oh I think I have to do one more thing. All right, before I get there. Anyway, let, let me just write this down at finite temperature, what this implies. Uh, what you find then is that d by d tau, g of tau equals 0 plus, uh, plus d by d tau of g of uh, tau equals 1 over temperature minus, which is basically related to this by the KMS condition, uh, must equal uh, integral minus infinity to infinity d omega omega m g of omega uh, and by Kramer's chronic this is just mu. So the discontinuity in the Green's function at 0 plus which is expressed by this factor of E must equal the chemical potential. So there is kind of a matching between again a UV property and an IR property. Mu is the chemical potential determining energy at uh, the structure at all frequencies whereas this E determines uh, the Green's function at small e. Anyway, so now you, you look at the structure of this and I, I think I'm just going to skip the details but that's the basic strategy. Uh, you, you then get a kind of a remarkable relation uh, that the mu dt at fixed Q turns out to be uh, minus 2 pi E. So, so the chemical potential as you raise the temperature a little bit uh, or let me write it this way or at fixed Q mu is mu naught minus 2 pi E Q plus higher order terms uh, 2 pi sorry 2 pi E T at fixed Q. So recall in a Fermi liquid I told you earlier F of a Fermi liquid mu is mu naught minus some constant times temperature squared. Okay. So in a Fermi liquid because you have particle holes symmetrically in the Fermi surface it requires some higher order corrections to have any change in the chemical potential. In this case because there is a particle hole asymmetry down to zero energy uh, adding a particle is very different even at low energies from removing a particle. Uh, you find the chemical potential is a much stronger function of temperature. It is a linear function of temperature. Uh, in some sense as we will see this is related to lots of low energy states. Uh, okay. So what does this mean? Well now this immediately gives you by Maxwell relation the low temperature entropy. Uh, so from this we will find that this is equal to by Maxwell relation. Uh, ds dq okay there's a minus sign now I know here uh, at fixed t uh, so q so if I go to t equals 0 this tells me that s changes as a function of q which is equal to 2 pi e so that's a very important relation that I'm going to write here okay all right so it turns out this relation uh, was independently discovered in a completely different paper by Ashok Sen studying the properties of black holes. So a black hole from Hawking's theorem has an entropy. Take a charged black hole with an ADS2 horizon. So it's got an entropy S. Uh, it's got a chem charge which you can compute by Gauss's law. And it's got an electric field E. That's E is the electric field on the surface of the black hole. Uh, and it also has a chemical potential which you can define as the uh, electromagnetic field uh, a, a vector potential at infinity. Uh, and so if you solve the einstein maxwell equation of a charged black hole which I will do very shortly uh, you find exactly these equations. Uh, black hole also is black from Einstein's equation you can get this equation you can get this one of course this follows from that by Maxwell relation and certainly Hawking showed that black holes do obey the Maxwell relation. Uh, so that's not a surprise. Uh, Anyway, so that's kind of why I'm emphasizing this. 
All right, uh, but here this is something just derived from this model and checked numerically uh, as properties of the ground state of this model. So this tells us that the entropy S uh, as t goes to 0 is some constant I call S0 which is not equal to 0. Uh, this prop okay, if you want to be, I've been dropping various factors of n, it's proportional to n. It's an extensive quantity like any, any other. All right, so what, what does this mean? Uh, what is this uh, entropy? How am I doing on time? I should probably. Okay, there's a lot I haven't covered. <laughs> I'm not going to, I think, if I, my original plan for the first two lectures may end up being four lectures the way I'm going, but I'm going at the right speed, I hope. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so what does this entropy mean? Well, one way to think about it is to plot the uh, uh, density of states. So let's just uh, look at, uh, and it's useful to contrast this. So, so if I take a Fermi liquid, which is the Q equals 2 model, and Q equals 4 uh, SYK. Okay, so there's, I'm going to draw all the energy levels. So this is the ground state, E0, uh, and these are energies here. This axis is energy. Uh, and this is of order, you know, the smallest energy state is minus n times t0 here. And the highest state would be n times t0. And there's many, many levels here. Uh, in general, there's 2 to the n levels. So it's 2 to the n levels. Uh, the energy level spacing here uh, must be 2 to the minus n. With factors of n in the prefactor, I don't care about. All right. So, so that's the generic energy level behavior for Fermi liquid. But there's something very special down here. What happens down here? Uh, at the very bottom of the band, something is very special because remember, you had the semicircular density of states with the chemical potential. And there were all these levels that you were filling. And the spacing between these levels is huge. It's 1 over n, which on the scale of 2 to the minus n is huge. So now the ground state, uh, all these were filled. And these were empty. Now if I want a very low energy state, there's only one way to get a low energy state, is to take one of these levels and move them here. And that's going to cost me energy 1 over n. So the spacing down here is 1 over n. All right. Uh, and in fact, we want to study what's happening here. That'll, that's why you need random matrix theory. There's lots of fluctuations. Uh, it doesn't self-average, if you really want to study what's happening here. Uh, in the many-body sense here, these are actually Poisson. These don't obey random statistics either, because they're just adding and removing particles from completely uncorrelated states to happen. The fact that these are so close to each other is a complete accident. It's not due to eigenvalue repulsion here. Uh, whereas it's uh, here, the fact that it's farther apart, has very much to do with eigenvalue repulsion. Uh, now, it's because of these large energy level spacing, uh, if you compute the entropy, in the, uh, that goes to zero. Uh, because you, you don't have exponentially many states here. OK, so what happens here is something, you know, the largest energy is n u naught. This is minus n u naught. Uh, so you've got a bunch of levels here. Again, the spacing is 2 to the minus n. Uh, but here, what is the spacing? The spacing is e to the minus n s naught. It's exponentially small. It's, you know, s naught is less than log 2, it turns out. So it's still much larger than this in the exponent. But compared to this, this is exponentially small. So it's because of this, there's so many low energy states, many body states, uh, that you have a non-zero entropy. Uh, and in this case, random matrix statistics, eigenvalue repulsion holds everywhere in the spectrum. Whereas here, it doesn't hold in the middle of the spectrum. In fact, doesn't accept, you know, paradoxically, it only holds at the bottom of the spectrum, where you're just adding, removing particles from a few states. So that's the difference that uh, you've lost. So this is really the, you know, the easiest way to see that there are no quasi-particles. Because if you had quasi-particles, you wouldn't get so many energy levels down here. There's no way to just add and remove single particle states, a few of them, and get so many states. They're all completely different states. 
They cannot be described by any kind of quasi particle excitation. Okay. Yeah. No, no, that's very important. Uh, so here's the chemical potential here, mu. So low energy state here are states in the middle of the bed because you're just adding the one particles here. So, so low energy in the many body sense is in the middle of the band in the random matrix sense. That's a crucial point. There's a huge amount of work, as I'm sure you know, what's happening down here. That has absolutely nothing to do with this, these low energy states. We're not in, these states are just filled. We're not interested in them. <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah, going from one body to many body has that effect. Your low energy states are really in the middle of the band. <laughs> That's because you're talking about a compressible state again. Uh, compressibility is what's giving you all of that. Yeah, so there's a, again a, a formula that I, I, I'd love to write it down. It's all kind of gamma functions and it's known, in, it's known exactly. <laughs> it's very universal. In other words, if I added six body, eight body, 10 body terms, it will not change the value of S0. It's the same. And S0 will turn out, of course, to be the zero temperature entropy of an extremal black hole. Okay. Um, this is how we computed it originally by this Maxwell relation. Uh, Ketev came up with another way of doing it, of taking a derivative with respect to this uh, Q parameter. Uh, fortunately, it gives exactly the same answer. So, <laughs> uh, so that's all great. So what's the reason for this? Is it Q equals 4? That's the reason? Um, yeah, well, Q equals 6 all are all the same. They all have the same property. Q equals 2 would not, would not Q equals 2 is special, yeah, because that's the case where uh, you don't have entropy, you have quasi-particles, that's Fermi-liquid. So Q equals 2 is very special, it's a Fermi-liquid-like state, it's a compressible Fermi-liquid state, uh, and this is a very different state of matter now. Uh, no, so S0 as a function of Q. Okay, that's not right. Anybody have a guess why David is wrong? I'd love to show David wrong. <laughs> it's not monotonic, so it both increases and decreases. Okay, let's see. Uh, so this is Q. Well, Q, remember, goes from zero to one. Oh, as a function of little Q. Yeah, yeah. I was asking. About oh, so that. again, David is always right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, let me just say what it does as a function of capital Q. So this is the <laughs> this is uh, the fully empty state. Uh, so the fully empty state, of course, has zero entropy. The fully filled state also has zero entropy. So it's just some function like this. Uh, it's maximum at Q equals one half, which is the Majorana point. This point is twice the Majorana value. Uh, okay, but we can get the full, we know the full exact equation of this curve, uh, and so on. I think it's about time, right? Also, I can, what, I, I should keep my phone, with, I turn my phone off. What time is it? And yes, please. Yes. Well, so here's the, uh, suppose these were quasi-particle states, uh, then I would, how would I build up the low energy states? I would build up the low energy state by occupying different quasi-particles. You know, so any quasi-particle state, uh, the total energy of a quasi-particle state is, you have, you have some quasi-particles energy E alpha, and N alpha is whether you occupy it or not. Okay, you just add up the energies. Then you can add with a Landau expansion some, uh, 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 what's called it, F alpha beta, N alpha N beta, plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, so these F E alpha and F alpha beta are various parameters. So these are called the Landau interaction parameters. Uh, these are just the single particle energy levels, and N alpha is zero or one. So the point is, how many parameters do I have here? I have N parameters. I have n squared here, and maybe n cubed, but let's assume after a while you don't have to worry about them. So it's a polynomial in n parameters. Uh, whereas n alpha equals zero, one gives you two to the n states. So what Landau Fermi liquid theory does is something quite amazing. It's, when you think about it this way, it's amazing, it even works. You describe two to the n states, exponentially large number of states, with a polynomial number of parameters. The adding and remove particles from different states, we then interact with each other. 
And since the spacing of these energy levels is 1 over n, the low-lying energy levels here will also have spacing order 1 over n. Uh, of course, eventually, you, you, know, this, uh, you can occupy lots of different states. So what, why is the spacing so, so close here? Well, it's because you know, so each state, if you wish, uh, is labeled by a string of zeros and ones, some sequence uh, of zeros and ones, which are the values of n alpha. So if I pick one level here and the next level here, the sequence are totally different. They're completely random. They have nothing to do with each other. Whereas if I'm down here, the sequences are very close to each other. You can only go from one level to the other by just rearranging a few quasi-particles, the low energy ones, the lowest energy ones. So you're forced by the structure of Landau like Permitic theory uh, to have a vanishing entropy in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, and the point is that here we know there's many more states, and I, I just don't see any way I can fit so many states uh, in such a paradigm. Hence, there are no quasi-particles. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, please. Well, I, I was referring to the S canonical fermions in the SYK model. So, so there, you know, uh, there is a unique, it's normal ordered, and there's a unique vacuum, which is annihilated by all C. That's what I mean by an empty universe. These are not relativistic particles. Uh, if you want, this thing mo looks most relativistic, in fact, at Q equals one half, which is the Majorana case. Uh, that's... That would be a relativistic empty universe would be Q equals a half. Uh, but you can go anywhere between the two limits. And for a charged black hole, it turns out you have to consider all of them. Uh, all right. Uh, I have only a few minutes. So let me actually say one more thing, which I meant to say, and I'll stop. Uh, well, yeah, uh, okay. My plan was to talk about this and then talk about black holes and uh, and then talk about fluctuations. So, so far I've just presented uh, the large n limit. Uh, there's uh, um, one more thing that, in fact, okay, I can say this now without, because it was historically also determined uh, before the modern developments. So I told you that G of t tau n Capital N, yeah, infinity. Yeah. It's gone to infinity. I'm looking at the leading large N limit. I had a one over N to the three half somewhere, right? Yeah. N is the number of sites. You have N sites, which are randomly. Yeah. Sorry, OK. Uh, so G of tau goes to infinity, we, we learned was one over square root of tau here and e to the minus two pi e one over square root of tau uh, and this is at t equals zero. Now it turns out if you look at those equations at finite temperature and study them and this is what George John Parko did, we're just looking at these equations and uh, and also by analogies to multi-channel counter problems you can get a solution also at t much much smaller than u naught uh, and g of tau turns out to be uh, basically what you might expect, uh, this 1 over square root of tau becomes sine of pi t tau, and then you put a pi t here to the 1 half. So that's a very familiar thing in conformal field theories, uh, that power law becomes sines. Uh, and then what happens to this asymmetry factor, uh, that becomes a prefactor e to the minus 2 pi e t tau. Okay. So this is, this is the Green's function for a fermion at small temperature uh, and, and long times. Okay, so this, is t this works for uh, t of order 1 over tau. We don't say anything about the relative value of these, but both are much, much smaller than uh, one, 
much, much greater than 1 over u. Uh, all right, so, so George and Parko, I initially obtained this just by looking at the equations I showed you and solving them at low temperature. They just, it's kind of amazing that this structure points out. Uh, and Kite have clarified this quite a bit. It, those equations have a SL2R invariance from which you can derive this. Uh, I'll say that something about that next time. But the reason I want to just bring this up is because uh, this is another property that we'll see uh, also is satisfied by black holes. So my next lecture will start by talking about Einstein. I'll talk about Einstein-Maxwell theory, theory of our universe with the appropriate boundary conditions. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then you find that there's a solution which has all of these properties that I mentioned. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, I'll be back. Thank you. Thank you.